Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. And blessed Juneteenth celebration. Um, we are honored that you all have joined on this celebration. It is my honor to introduce a transformational leader, a pastor of pastors, our community leader here in the city of Trenton and the state of New Jersey. Uh, we are in a, an historic house today, Friendship Baptist Church, amen? amen? And we are honored today to have the pastor, the shepherd of this flock, Reverend Dr. John Taylor. Everybody knows who he is? Uh, who is doing such an amazing, amazing job and work here in the city of Trenton, who will introduce our Lieutenant Governor, and then our Lieutenant Governor will introduce our Governor. God bless you. Reverend Dr. John Taylor. It feels like Sunday morning. <laughs> God bless everyone, and we greet you uh, in the love of Christ, and I pray that uh, all is well right before we start. Before I bring forth our lieutenant uh, governor, I want to recognize all of our political leaders from North Jersey, Central Jersey, and South Jersey. That's all our politicians to please stand in your respective places. Amen. Amen. We love all of you. You have helped us uh, through the struggle, and you're still helping us. I did it like that because I start calling names. I, I miss somebody. And I don't want to do that, especially when I'm celebrating Juneteenth. Uh, all clergy, please stand. North Jersey, Central, and South Jersey. God bless you. And I'm quite sure for some of you, it's your first time being here uh, in uh, friendship. And we try to do what our name say, we are friendly ship. So we pray today that you will uh, enjoy your space and time here with us. I'm elated to introduce such a powerful and wonderful a woman as our Lieutenant Governor, Sheila Oliver. She has blazed the trail for so many uh, women, uh, people, period. This is a humanity moment, and it gives me a great honor and great pleasure to introduce the Lieutenant Governor, Sheila Oliver. Give her a hand. <laughs> Well, first of all, uh, Reverend Taylor, it's wonderful to be in a place called Friendship. And uh, as we look around the sanctuary, I see nothing but friends. So thank you for creating this for us today on this Juneteenth. Um, you know, I've been having all day and all week ambivalent feelings about Juneteenth. Now, many of us have been aware of Juneteenth and its significance. And because of a movement that has been created in this country over the past several weeks, more people are learning about what Juneteenth is about. And, you know, I chuckled to myself that we know that Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. But I shook my head and I said, just like today, the black folks get the message two years later. And yes, you give an amen to that. I know that to be true. <laughs> so we celebrate.
celebrate because the enslaved people, and there were 250,000 of them, it is, it is described, they learned in Galveston, Texas, that they could go. They were free to go. And that is the reason we signify that this is a day of significance. But, you know, if you are an, a like to read, like I like to read, and I've been reading a lot of essays lately, I've been reading um, a lot of articles that people are writing. Um, you know there is a prolific writer who, um, last year for the New York Times, she documented uh, the 1619 project telling the history over the 400 years. Yes. So I think that this year, Juneteenth, is different than any other Juneteenth. Absolutely. Absolutely. We live on the East Coast, and in Texas and Oklahoma, and the states out in that region of the country, they've always been aware of Juneteenth. But now it has traveled across the 50 states. I have ambivalent feelings about it, because I want to, for me personally, use Juneteenth as a day to honor the ancestors. Mm -hmm. That's what this day means to me, to give homage to the ancestors. But I am not quite prepared yet to call Juneteenth the day that celebrates our freedom. Mm -hmm. I'm not ready for that yet. Because what will, what will help us celebrate our freedom is economic freedom, educational freedom, political freedom, and all things associated. But we are kind of blessed in New Jersey to long before the BLM movement took fire to this country long before everyone prepared to celebrate Juneteenth today. We are blessed in New Jersey to have a governor who knew us and who knew our historical struggles before he set foot in the capital city. Governor Murphy they often say, actions speak louder than words. Uh -huh. Governor Murphy, in the short period of time that he has occupied the governor's office, he has followed through with elevating the minimum wage in this state. He has followed through with supporting the provision of early childhood education to all children in this state. He has followed through, as we were with uh, Mayor Gusioria earlier today, with environmental justice to stop polluting our neighborhoods. He has followed through with an agenda that, in my opinion, he's clung on to those things that are representative of freedom for people of color. He has not turned a back on undocumented citizens in this state. And Governor, you got an affirmation by the Supreme Court. Amen. Because the Supreme Court ruled this week, if your parents brought you to this country and you were two or three years old, you can stay here. So Governor Murphy has been out front on these issues. He has been out front with recognizing that the African American community in this state has supported him. And we came to the table to show him how we supported him by delivering 94% of the African American vote to get him elected. So I can think of no other governor and I won't leave out, he helped raise money for the NAACP at a national level. 
I won't leave that out. And I won't leave out that he was finance director for our president, President Barack Obama. And as a, a man who hails from the state of Massachusetts, growing up in the city of Boston, he is no stranger to urban issues, and he is no uh, stranger to issues of the struggles of people of color. And Reverend Taylor, I think that is why you have invited Governor Phil M. Murphy to French today. Governor Murphy. Thank you, Phil. Thank you all. Wow. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Wow, that is, I got a, I better, I was sitting in the money seat, as Reverend Taylor said here, right behind. I better not let you down, Pastor. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, most important thing I'm going to say is I want to give glory and honor to God for allowing me to be here today. So everything else is downhill after that. Uh, Derek, thank you for everything. You're here with your first lady, Miss Kim, and uh, thank you so much for everything. You've, you've been an extraordinary friend to me and a great colleague over these past number of years. So bless you, and I'll give you an early happy Sabbath. And Sheila, what, what can we say about you? You are my partner in government. Uh, you are an extraordinary leader. You know, you all know this, but uh, the lieutenant governor in this state wears two hats. Uh, and in addition to being the lieutenant governor, Sheila run, runs the biggest operation of any operation we have in the state, the Department of Community Affairs, which by definition touches every community in the state. Uh, and you do it extraordinarily well. Uh, and these are tough issues. Uh, our brothers and sisters from Atlantic City, by example, will know how hard it has been uh, to work to get that, that relationship from what was really a boot, uh, on, as you and I used to call it, now sadly we've seen a knee on the neck. It was a boot on the neck, big footing. Uh, whenever, you, I can guarantee you this, whenever communities or school districts are taken over in this state, this is not most of the time, this is literally all the time, uh, it's, it's a community of color, period. It's 100% the case. Uh, Amir knows this in Camden, um, and they certainly know it in Atlantic City. And just using that as one example, Terry Tucker right beside her every step of the way, uh, just extraordinary leadership. So I want one more time to an extraordinary leader, the Lieutenant Governor of the great state of New Jersey, <laughs> Sheila Y. Oliver. <laughs> Amen. To my friend, that guy right there, Reverend John Taylor, I give greetings to you and the First Lady and to the deacons, trustees, officers, members, and friends and family of Friendship Baptist Church. I also have to include, with a Leslie speaker right by my side, the music ministry. Uh, and look forward to getting back in here and worshiping and hearing these, this drum kit and that Leslie speaker uh, screaming out some uh, beautiful uh, gospel music. Pastor, I must also thank you for your extraordinary leadership here in Trenton. The mayor is with us. Uh, we were together earlier, as, as Sheila said, along with Senator Turner, Verlina, uh, on a huge moment around environmental justice. And you all know this well, uh, what, what Pastor Taylor means for Trenton and for all he does, not just within the spiritual community and inside the sanctuary, but in the greater community that ex extends into the community beyond these sacred walls. You have stood with the people of this great city during triumphant days and days when there have been trials. And you have stood with me in our commitment to socioeconomic justice. We've known each other since well before I took office, and I have always appreciated your guidance and support. And by the way, with no fanfare, uh, this guy calls me about once every week or 10 days just to check in on me and say in a prayer for me, uh, uh, which is extraordinary, particularly during the past, <laughs> during the past few months. Um, and I thank you, last but not least, for inviting me to say a few words here in this extraordinary house on the uh, observation of Juneteenth. To all, I mentioned some of the electeds, but to each and every one of you who are in this chamber, especially folks who travel, whether it's been from Bridgeton or Plainfield or, or from wherever you came from, the corporate leaders, Rick, it's an honor to have you here, the faith leaders, Reverend Roundtree, I love you, I love you, I see you back there. 
Amir up from, uh, from Camden, from all over the state. I look around here. So to each and every one of you, it's very humbling that you'd come out uh, on this day uh, and spend a few minutes together. So you all know this, but let's recount what this day is. 155 years ago, it was when Union General Gordon Granger, a white man, landed with troops in Galveston, Texas. John Harmon, I see you there, by the way. Thank you for coming. Uh, to spread the word that all enslaved blacks were at last free. Yet, as Sheila, a little footnote on that, right? Uh, President Abraham Lincoln had signed the Emancipation Proclamation on New Year's Day in 1863, 900 days earlier. So for 900 days, thousands of enslaved black Americans continued to toil in the most horrible of conditions, not knowing that they were free women and men. But look at the history of black America since then. Yes, we can celebrate the end of the literal and physical chains which held blacks as chattel, but in doing so, we cannot ignore the figurative chains which have kept our proud black communities from achieving the full equality which they deserve, which they have been promised, and which is their most basic right. So this Juneteenth, it is a black America rising to tell us that we can no longer ignore the 401-year history of slavery and systemic racism. Amen. 401 years since the first enslaved Africans arrived on the shores of this continent. A history that is writ large in the, as Sheila alluded to this, in the inequalities in wages and wealth, in health care, in housing, in education, in economic opportunity, and on and on and on down the line, including in treatment by law enforcement. The long history of slavery and the stain of racism is directly linked to the conditions of African Americans today. Systemic racism has not only existed in America and in New Jersey, but it still exists. Those of us who have been granted privilege because of the color of our skin must recognize the many generations of pain which have been visited upon those without that privilege. I also recognize and celebrate the new generation of Americans who refuse to inherit this legacy. Across our nation and indeed our world, I was just watching as I walked out of the office a soccer match, professional match in London between Tottenham Hotspurs and Manchester United. On the back of their jerseys, you know what it says instead of their names? Black Lives Matter. And by the way, they also have a patch in their right arm that says Black Lives Matter. So it's not just across our nation, but indeed right now around the world, hundreds of thousands, if not, I believe, in the many millions of people are awakening to the words written in Scripture. You'll forgive me, Pastor, for reading Scripture without a license or education. Uh, The book of John, chapter 8, verse 32, and I quote, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Too, Too many among us have kept our blinders on for too long. It has taken more than 400 years for the truth that black lives matter to finally be given meaning and humanity. For too long and in too many corners we couldn't see, or even worse, in some cases did not want to see, the truth that systemic racism still to this day permeates our society and our failure to address that truth has stunted our path to freedom. Not, by the way, your path to freedom, but our path to freedom. This is not about one man or one woman. This is about all of us together. And let us always remember that these values are the ones we must also bring to our fight for justice for our immigrant communities who also face discrimination. And a big day indeed yesterday on that front. And by the way, shocking to me that it happened, but it's a big one nonetheless. The reason that black lives matter is because we are one state, one family, and we rise and fall, and we march, 
and we protest as one. Saying black lives matter is saying that in the struggle for the soul of humanity, that we must acknowledge a community that has been victimized for, four or for 401 years by racism and discrimination. Saying black lives matter boldly states that we will not inherit your racism. We will fight it wherever it raises its ugly head. Several weeks ago, in fact, Derek, you were with me, I had an opportunity to attend back-to-back -back rallies. Uh, first one uh, in Hillside, your old hometown, uh, overwhelmingly, uh, predominantly a community of color, and then literally an hour later in Westfield, uh, overwhelmingly a white community. The march, or the, the vigil rather, uh, Hillside was a march, but Westfield was a vigil, was organized by a 16-year-old student who challenged her city and school to look inside their souls and to proclaim Black Lives Matter. And in each case, but in this case in Westfield, I saw thousands of people, mostly white residents, who have awoken to the reality of what it means to be a good ally. Proclaim to the world and be proud of it. And don't hesitate that black lives matter. However, black lives matter are not just words. It is and must be a personal call to action. Let me be clear, if I may, systemic racism is a crisis that has infected every aspect of American life. And I will work tirelessly with Sheila to address it and its cascading effects. We will continue to work with our advisors, members of our cabinet and the legislature, especially with members of the Legislative Black Caucus. Uh, Senator Turner, thank you for your leadership. Verlina, thank you for yours. Uh, to Sen in absentia, to Senator Ron Rice and Assemblywoman Shavonda Sumter and others. We'll continue to work together on policy that will highlight and work to root out the disparities in housing, income, transportation, education, and other issue areas that have a direct impact on black and brown people and communities. And by the way, I did not decide, and Sheila was very gracious toward me as a former national board member of the NAACP and one of my dearest friends in life was Ju the late Julian Bond. Um, I did not decide, we did not decide just last week or a few weeks ago that Black Lives Matter. This has been a lifelong commitment. Black Lives Matter in wages and wealth creation, so we will push for additional meaningful economic opportunities for our families. Black Lives Matter and criminal justice reform, so we will continue reshaping a more community-centered form of law enforcement. Black, by the way, one, one of the most important, and another reason I love you, Reverend, one of the, the senior chaplain to the state police and a, and a guy who's in there and understands these issues right in the, in the middle of it. Black Lives Matter in housing, where we will continue to provide resources to support affordable home ownership and those needing rental assistance. Black Lives Matter in infant and maternal health, where we must eliminate disparate treatment in medical care. Black Lives Matter in education, from preschool to a college degree, where we must make equity a core value in how we develop education policy. Black Lives Matter in the environment, where we must eliminate unequal community impacts, and that's where several of us were earlier, and that was a big step in that direction. And Black Lives Matter in Camden, or Atlantic City, or right here in Trenton, and in suburban and rural communities alike. So already, we have taken some big steps together, and Sheila alluded to some of this. We have put our minimum wage in a solid path to $15 an hour. We have given everyone who works the guarantee of a paid sick day and access to expanded paid family leave. Reva, thank you for your support at every step of the way. By the way, bless you. We know these progressive steps predominantly benefit people of color who have held a disproportionate number of low-wage jobs. We have increased funding for our public schools and investments in pre-K, as you mentioned, Sheila, a cornerstone for building a stronger future for countless thousands of kids. And we started a historic program which today is allowing thousands of residents to attend community college and get their associate's degree tuition free. I want to give the First Lady Tammy Murphy a shout out in absentia. Um, 
through her tremendous work, and, and by the way, she's brought together 18 different state departments and agencies, faith and community leaders, healthcare leaders, and elected officials from up and down the state. We are meaningfully confronting our infant and maternal health crisis. A black woman, you know this, but it must be repeated. A black woman in New Jersey is nearly five times more likely than a white woman to die from pregnancy-related complications and a black baby is three times more likely than a white baby to die before her or his first birthday. This abhorrent reality is why we have joined together with hundreds of partners throughout the state to develop a statewide strategic plan to decrease our rate of maternal mortality by 50% over five years and completely eliminate the inequities in birth outcomes. And given the current national tenor we have put New Jersey squarely at the forefront of the national fight for justice. In December of last year, and thank God I did, uh, I was proud, uh, with Sheila at my side, to sign bills addressing some of the ways our criminal justice system holds people back even after conviction. New Jersey now is the most progressive expungement reform in the entire nation, allowing for the expungement of records of residents whose futures have been held back because of past convictions and it gives residents on pro per parole or probation back their right to vote. Amen. I'm not patting myself on the, on the back. Sheila agrees with me, Derek, the whole team, Jarrell Harvey, where are you? Jarrell, you're in the back. Aswan, where are you? We, we got we to, uh, Edwin is with us. We all believe in second chances and I've taken a lot of heat for this. And you know what? I'm very happy to take the heat. Uh, because I want to be the second chance state, yeah. the place where you can get back. Yeah. Amen. So that's why we've created a second chance agenda. As I sought this office, I heard the stories of those whose futures were uncertain because of a low-level offense on their record, and because of that record, they could not get employment. The expungement law, in particular, helps to reverse the impact of unjust laws and sentencing that started, by the way, during slavery and continued for decades and centuries. Our commitment to creating safe communities and neighborhoods through a criminal justice system that lives up to that all important word, justice, and enacting the recommendations of the Criminal Sentencing and Disposition Commission, which by the way include the elimination of mandatory minimum sentences for nonviolent drug offenses, has only, that conviction has only grown even stronger. And through the tremendous work, and I have to give him a shout out in absentia, of Attorney General Gerbeer Graywall and another great leader, State Police Superintendent Colonel Pat Callahan, we are under, undertaking a transformation in the culture of policing across our state. They have, to their credit, traveled up and down our state building partnerships with faith and community leaders, residents and stakeholders, so that this transformation in policing and police culture is achieved through direct and open collaboration with our diverse communities. And we have seen across our state over the past few weeks the natural outgrowth of these efforts. Law enforcement joining their communities in committing to the simple natural law that black lives matter. I have to say a couple of things. Number one, Derek hosts a faith call and has every morning since this pandemic hit us. And I don't think Colonel Callahan has missed one. Uh, to his enormous credit. Uh, and secondly, we have now had, since George Floyd was murdered, we've had something, you'll bear with me, something around 425 protests. Uh, this is now, when you add up the people, at the, I mean, Newark had one with over 10, right, Louise, over 10,000 people at one of those. There's tens and tens and tens of thousands of, of people who have protested, 58 arrests. People have been, and by the way, all of those happened in three very specific incidents and they were weeks ago. So I'm, not, I'm knocking on wood because there's a lot happening today and there's a lot happening this weekend, as there should be. Um, but it's an extraordinary record that no state in America can come close to. Under the Attorney General, New Jersey has emerged as a national leader in increasing accountability, transparency, and professionalism, which brings us closer to a reimagined police culture. Just this week,
the Attorney General directed all law enforcement agencies to make public the names of officers who were fired, demoted, or suspended for more than five days due to a serious disciplinary violation. The this, this speaks to a core value. Those who discredit their badge should not be allowed to hide behind that badge. Superintendent Pat Callahan is taking the directive even further. He is committed to not just releasing these names prospectively in the future, but releasing 20 years worth of names from the state police. As a result, amen. As a result, other agencies are taking similar steps, a sure sign that they not only wish to change for the future, but that they also wish to account for their pasts. That is what lays at the heart of this matter. It is well past time for us to account for our past. We cannot escape the fact that our own criminal justice system has an inconsistent past in its relationship with black and brown communities. In New Jersey, we have our own history of police-involved deaths. Maurice Gordon is just one example. Our condolences, thoughts, and prayers go out to the family and every family who has shared in a tragic loss. We, we mourn the loss of every single life. And here, we have a law which I signed, that and thank God I did, thank God we were behind that, Sheila, that requires our Attorney General to independently investigate any officer-involved deaths and to present evidence before a grand jury. That's not an option, that is a requirement. Uh, and that puts us at the head that alone won't get us to the promised land, ladies and gentlemen, you know that, but that puts us at the head of the American class. We will lead the nation in creating a system of transparency and integrity in the legal process. <laughs> Ours is a nation conceived in liberty, and yet 244 years after our founding document declared, quote, to a candid world that all men are created equal, we must reckon with the fact in the starkest of terms and in the sharpest of images that we are far from achieving that promised equality. Ask George Floyd if he was treated as an equal, or Breonna Taylor, or Armand Aubrey, or more recently, Rayshard Brooks. Ask John William Smith, whose arrest in Newark in 1967 sparked the Newark uprisings. Ask Medgar Evers, or Emmett Till, or Dred Scott for that matter. This brings hope to the quest for justice. The names of the slaves in Texas who learned of their freedom on Juneteenth are unknown but to history. But the names of those whose lives have been cut short because of systemic racism are known to us all, and they must be. Unless we forget this is leaning back to my Boston uh, years, Sheila. I, I was hoping you would keep that to yourself. Gets me no votes in New Jersey, by the way. <laughs> Lest we forget the first American killed in our nation's first fight, the fight for independence and liberty in 1770, was a black man, Crispus Attucks. So how have we honored that le legacy? We cannot allow ourselves to walk through this world with blinders on claiming emptily that we don't see race, when what that means is we are ignoring the inequalities that exist this very day. We cannot escape the fact that systemic racism, not the outward racism of hate groups, but the silent racism of complacency, has bled into nearly every facet of our society. New Jersey, I'm proud to say, is a leader, and we will remain a leader in bringing the change we need. Our administration came to office with a commitment to tackling and dismantling systemic racism, but despite our stride so far, of which we are very proud, we know that our work is far from finished. We will continue to stand in solidarity with everyone in this sanctuary and with everyone of you out there watching and with everyone protesting in the streets. Do it peacefully, by the way. Wear a face covering and go get tested afterwards. Just a quick uh, health request there, Senator. Our goal, not as an administration, but as a society, is this. That the pain of yesterday 
And indeed, the pain of today does not become the pain of tomorrow. There are too many who are not alive and, and with us anymore as we continue this work to ensure true freedom and equality, both in word and in deed for all of us. But their memories and their spirits will guide us forward as they always have. Let's do this together. Let's make Juneteenth, this Juneteenth, 2020, a day not just of historic recognition, but the day where we took another step forward in transforming our state in a way that future generations will celebrate. And as we move forward, let us be led again, please permit me, Reverend, uh, by the words found in Scripture in 2 Corinthians verse 3, chapter 17, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Let this be our charge. Thank you all, and God bless you all. May we all stand for the benediction. If we could give our governor and lieutenant governor another round of applause. We're blessed to have that leadership in this state. Father God, we thank you for this beautiful day. God, we thank you that you are a God of justice, a God of righteousness, a God of freedom. God, we ask that you bless our country. We pray for our president. We pray for Congress. And God, we pray for our state. We thank you for giving us a governor with the ethos that he has and giving us a lieutenant governor with the ethos that she has. We pray for our legislature. We pray for all of our elected officials, our mayors, our community leaders, our faith leaders, God, and we pray for our communities. Bless us, have mercy upon us through this pandemic. Heal our land, God. We need your healing. Bless our families. Put a circle around us during these times. In your humble name we pray in the name of Jesus the Christ, in the name of Allah, in the name of Jehovah. Yes. We pray, amen. amen. Thank you all. Thank you.